Oh yeah, of course. Like, of course. But then with John Stewart, he's love. Like, he's like he's, he's like your he's like your Judy Dench. When he's loud. Whenever he's loud. <laughs> when he comes in. Good morning. I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy. Do do boo do. Yankee Doodle do or die. Real live nephew to my first cousin, Uncle Sam. Born on the 4th of July. I've got me a Yankee Yankee Doodle sweetheart. Living in this land of mine She's a red, white, and blue All our way through and through Cause I'm a Yankee Doodle boy I'm the kid that's all the candy A Yankee Doodle all my life I'll make my name and seek a fortune Living in this land that I call mine Just like Mr. Doodle did it Wearing a wig upon his crown Minding the music and stepping high while riding a pony into town Nothing about my pedigree is phony Cause I'm a Yankee Doodle till I die A real life nephew to my first cousin Uncle Sam Born on the 4th of July Yeah, I Doodle sweetheart, she's my Yankee Doodle Joe. Yankee Doodle went to town a riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his hat and called it Yankee Doodle Boy. Tell you a little bit about that song real quick. That uh, hadn't you sang that song your whole life? Not, not maybe not the first part, but Yankee Doodle went to town riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his hat. A macaroni I found out this week was a wig. Huh? A macaroni wig. It's the, it's those funny little curly Q wigs that the oh, founding fathers you we always eat wigs see. with Cause cheese once a week. Oh well, well anyway. Well <laughs> and that was a put down by the British. Back during the American Revolution, they called them Yankee Doodle Dandies because they were so uh, uh, un uncouth and uncivilized. And so the uh, the rebels of the American Revolution took it up and put the put down and put it into that song, and now we all sing it. So there you go. we got a few songs for you today we'll tell you a little bit about. Some alternative patriotic songs today that uh, I hope you'll enjoy. We're going to warm up to this song while we do. Stand up, find somebody you don't know, and say, it's nice to meet you. Happy Fourth of July to you. You may be seated. Announcement time, announcement time. I know you don't pay attention to me or Sean, but please pay attention to the lady. Okay. Good morning, folks. 
Bridget and I have been working real hard in the past several weeks to update the spreadsheet of all of our names and phone numbers and email addresses. So I'm sending it around. And if you'll just take a glance at it and make any corrections, additions, deletions, if you're not on there and you want to be on it, I have a blank sheet at the back. And then from here on out, what I'm going to do, I'm going to have a full sheet downstairs on the table each week to correct. And we're going to keep it always up to date so that if somebody wants an updated list, all you have to do is just email me or Bridget. We'll send it to you. But we need to make sure we have a good base list because we've had a lot of just over the years. So anyway, thanks a bunch. And y'all, I'm glad it's the 4th of July weekend. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Nice and succinct. <laughs> what do you call me? One, two, three, four. Some have said, now do history if you last. Well, it's a mystery, but I guess they don't know what they're talking about. From the mountains, Way down to the seas, you become such a habit with me, America. America. Well, I come from down around OKC, but the people in simple faith have been kind to me, America. America. It don't matter where I may roam. I tell people Walton is my own sweet home, America. Oh, America. Yeah, and my brothers, they're all black and white, yellow too. And the red man is right to expect a little from you. Promise and then follow through America. In the men who fell down on the plains and they lived through a war of pain, America. Yeah, America. Yeah, men who just could not fight in a war that really didn't feel right. You let them come home, America. Oh, and my brothers, they're all black and white, yellow too. And a red man is right to expect a little from you. And then follow through America. Come on, Stuart. Ronnie's forbidden me from telling jokes anymore. <laughs> How's that go? Uh, no, no. 
We're going to say a prayer today for Matt Miller. Not only is he at home sick this morning and would be playing with us, but in a terrible accident, he lost his fiddle last night. An amp fell over and and crushed it. And this is like a 10-year-old fiddle that was made for him. And uh, I think that's what he's sick about and why he's at home today. So So we're going to – we've all sent him messages when you told us on on our phones, but pray for Matt. Give us your tired and weak And we will make them strong Bring us your foreign songs And we will sing along Leave us your broken dreams We will give them time to mend There's still a lot of love to be found Living in the promised land Living in the promised land Our dreams are made of steel The prayer of every man Is to know how freedom feels There's a winding road Across the shifting sand And room for everyone Living in the promised land It came from a distant isle Nameless woman, faithless child Like a bad dream Till there was no room at all No place to run and No place to fall Give up a daily bread We have no shoes to wear No place to call our home Only this cross to bear We are the multitudes Lend us a helping hand Is there no love anymore Living in the promised land Living in the promised land Our dreams are made of steel The prayer of every man Is to know how freedom feels There's a winding road Across the shifting sand And room for everyone Living in the promised land Room for everyone Living in the promised land Make room for everyone Living in the promised land Great song coming up right here from uh, Slave Song from the Civil War.
and before I'd be a slave, you better bury me in my grave and go to my Lord and be free. Before I would be a slave, you better bury me in my grave. Oh, I'm a going home, and there I will be free.
come and sing a simple song of freedom. Sing it like you've never sung before. Let it fill the air. Tell the people everywhere. We the people here don't want a war. Hey there, Mr. Black Man. Can you hear me? I don't want your diamonds or your game. I just want to be someone known to you as me. And I will bet my life you want the same. 700 million, are you listening? Most of what you read is made of lies. Speaking one to one, ain't it everybody's son to wake up in the morning when we rise? Come and sing a simple song of freedom. Sing it like you've never sung before. Let it fill the air. Tell the people everywhere. We, the people here, don't want a war. Brother Solzhenitsyn, are you busy? If not, would you drop a friend a line? Tell me if the man who is plowing up your land has got that war machine on his mind. Cause no doubt some folks enjoy doing battle like presidents Prime Ministers and Kings So let us build some shelves Where they can fight among themselves And leave the people be who love to sing Come and sing the simple song of freedom Sing it like you've never sung before let it fill the air, tell the people everywhere, we the people here don't want a war. Come and sing a simple song of freedom, sing it like you've never sung before. Let it fill the air. Tell the people everywhere, we the people here don't want the war. You've been watching the Lawrence Welk Show. <laughs> no, Stuart has. <laughs> Y'all are quiet, man. It's killing me. I hear that rain. Stayed up too late watching fireworks. Mm, I saw a few of you out there. And drinking. Having a little too much fun. Yeah, we saw you. God 
shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brother from sea to shine and see. You know, this is the first song I played with y'all, Ronnie. Ever? When we were at Seaside. I know it. I was thinking about that this week. Sometimes the first late, time we bad, ever played. Late play at night, think about it. Do you? The first, the first time we ever played together was on July 4th weekend. You did this one. That's right. Sometimes I miss old David. I'm, I'm, feel, I'm feeling misty right now just thinking about it. Me too. Whoa, beautiful for the pilgrim's feet who stern in passion to rest a thoroughfare of freedom beats across the wilderness America America confirm Ricky Stanfield played drums for us today in the absence of Tim, and he's, he's on his way out the back door right now because he has to get to Niceville for another uh, 4th of July gig. This, this boy's playing everywhere these days, so uh, now his mom and dad are hugging him back there because they ain't seen him in a week and things like that. So. <laughs> Thank you, Ricky. <clears throat> 
A few years ago, I wrote this little book that uh, more than anything else I've ever put on paper has given me all this gray hair that's now growing on my face and starting to invade my crown, but I couldn't stop myself. The book is entitled The Jesus Tribe, Following Christ in the Land of the Empire, and I knew it wouldn't be a bestseller, and I knew that it would be controversial. And I knew that it would be so unsettling for so many that they would not take the time to just pause and think and consider the perspective I was offering. What is that perspective? Well, the premise is this. Regardless of whatever denomination we are a part of, the majority of this country's churches do not simply love America. They are fiercely joined to American goals, ambitions, ideas, and nationalism. So much so that they can't tell where flag-waving stops and following Jesus begins. It's a muddy conjoining of allegiances, and it is based on a very sandy foundation. And that foundation is the notion that America actually belongs to Christians and that Christians belong to America. We believe that the church and the state can make beautiful music together if only they would cooperate. We believe that the preaching of the kingdom of God and the rallying around the red, white, and blue are always compatible. We believe that we can hold to the sacrificial, life-giving, peace-pursuing, cheek-turning, boundary-breaking way of Christ and hold to the domineering, power-hungry, line-drawing, and interest-protecting systems of the world. And that is impossible. Now, what is wrong with a little flag-waving? What's the problem with the red, white, and blue cross? Can't we be Americans and Christians? Absolutely. So long as we remember that there is no such thing as an American Christian. There are simply Christians who happen to live in America. And there is a big difference between those two. I love America, but not at the expense of marginalizing Jesus. Does that make sense? I'll say the pledge, but I will not intentionally put up barriers between me and my other brothers and sisters who are not Americans. You know there are Christians in other countries, right? And that our connection to them because they are Christian is even stronger than nationalism. It must be. And yes, I'll sing the national anthem, but I will not ask Jesus to share his place of supremacy with any nation. I am more committed to Christ than I am to country. And my home is the kingdom of God, not an empire of the present world. Now, that sounds treasonous. I know it does. And I won't ignore the fact that such a perspective is, perspective is exactly what got the first Christians martyred. Do you know that? Oh, you can have your religion, but you have to swear your allegiance to Caesar. And when they said, well, our Lord is Christ, well, off to the lions with you. When the church gathers to worship, it is gathering as a people with a distinct allegiance. And that allegiance is to Christ. Not necessarily to the place of our birth, not to the war on terror, not to the Jeffersonian documents in the Smithsonian. The bond that unites believers is Jesus Christ, not a national flag. And that's a naughty little problem this country. Let me put it simply, I could summarize everything I've just said with one sentence. Jesus has never been 
this country's primary concern. How's that? That's a plain fact. It has been more concerned with what every empire concerns itself with. Power. Gaining it and protecting it. And using violence when necessary to guard it. A little history lesson we don't always get in middle school. If you go back to our European ancestors, not the founding fathers, go back further than that. A thousand years ago, Europeans learned something that went into their little toolbox, something that the Romans had learned, something the Greeks had known, and every world empire that had ever existed, they knew this, that religion was a powerful tool of conquest. And so the Pope called for a crusade to the Holy Land. How could good Christians in Europe sit aside and let the land of Jesus be occupied by these infidels? And he rallied up an army and they marched to Palestine to liberate Palestine even though for hundreds and hundreds of years Muslims and Jews and Christians have been living peaceably alongside each other in that land. And in those crusades they learned how to pillage and rape, and conquer, and kill with red crosses on their shields and the name of Jesus on their lips. Well, it didn't take long for that spirit to make its way to the new world. The Spaniards were the first to get here with this religious fervor. The Spanish conquistadors forged in the fires of crusade made their way to the Americas and they brought their religious crusade with them. The Spanish when they landed in a new area made it a habit to read something called the requirement and it was read to the native tribes, tribes of the western hemisphere. They read it in the Caribbean, they read it all over South America, Mexico, what is now Texas, California and Ponce de Leon read it when he landed on the shores of what we now call Florida. It was a note of welcome from the king of Spain and from the church. And it read like this. And they read it in Spanish as if the natives could understand it. <laughs> I implore, implore you to recognize the church as your lady and in the name of the Pope to take the king as lord of this land and obey its mandates. If you do not do this, I tell you that with the help of God, I will powerfully come against you, I will make war everywhere and in every way I can, and I will subject you to the yoke and obedience of the church and to His majesty. And that's what they did. The Western Hemisphere was conquered and subjugated at the sharp end of a sword, the smoking barrel of a gun, and in the name of the church and the blessing of the cross. And before you think it was just those hot-blooded Spaniards, because you know how they are, and just those murderous Catholics, because you know how they are, it was also our direct ancestors, British Protestants. They were eager to kill and conquer in Jesus' name, just like all the others. The Puritans came to the New World in 1630, and they were governed by a man named John Winthrop, who still has incredible influence in American policy and politics today. Why did the Puritans come to America? Do you remember why? They came to gain religious freedom. They were in the Church of England, and the Church of England was persecuting them. And they said, you know what? The best thing to do is get away from this church. We'll go to the new land. In 1630, they came. But what's so interesting about their idea of, of religious freedom was everybody's going to have religious freedom over here. Freedom that looks like ours. Which is so often the case. Because they were the only ones, they said, capable of doing it right and God had given them North America, I love this phrase from Winthrop, to save it from being wasted. And on the boat that brought the Puritans to their new home, Winthrop preached, we will establish the proper fusion of religion and government. The Lord will be our God and He shall make us a praise and glory for we shall be a city on a hill 
The eyes of the world are upon us. May the Lord our God bless us in the land we go to possess. And every president that the United States has ever had at some point in their tenure has quoted that line. And it's sad because those are Jesus' words. It's from the Sermon on the Mount. Did you know that? Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Like a city upon a hill that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Winthrop said that verse applies to America. And Jesus said it applies to the church. It applies to people who follow me. You cannot take those words, any country or kingdom or nation, and act as if Jesus was talking about our country. And it's here that tangled knot that makes me so gray, the separation of church and state. Now, you won't hear this from many pulpits, but I won't, I'll say this. I am for it. The separation of church and state. And I always will be because of our history. When the church is fused with country, when the church is in charge, we have the propensity to hurt people. We go marching off on holy crusades, trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. We show up with our swords in our hands and exterminate those who don't believe the way we do. We start making weird and hellacious applications of the scriptures to justify all manner of meanness and slavery. The church, check your history books on this, the church has never succeeded in all of 2,000 years of Christian history to straighten out a government when it gets in bed with the government. In 2,000 years of Christian history, what always happens in that case is the church gets corrupted. Every time. And we can't seem to figure that out. Because the only way that church and state together works is if it's your church. Right? Let somebody else's church get in charge. Oh, wait a minute. And this is important for us to remember because this year, for the first time in four centuries, the Protestant majority in America is no longer the majority. Protestants are now 48% of the U.S. population. In a few more decades, there will not be a majority of Christian people. And in another century, the phrase white middle class American Christian will be an anomaly because Christianity is shrinking in the global north and exploding in the global south. And the center of Christianity will shift from Europe and North America to South America and to Africa. <clears throat> and then you better pray that the separation of church and state remains to protect our consciences. Where did this idea of separation of church and state come from? Well, Thomas Jefferson coined the phrase, so we are told, First Amendment of the Constitution. Before him, John Locke used that phrase in his writings. But before either of them, it was John Winthrop's buddy, a man named Roger Williams, who said way back in 1644, more than a hundred years before it would be used in the Constitution, quote, a wall of separation must exist between the garden of the church, and the wilderness of the world. How did Williams come to this conclusion? Because he found himself being persecuted by the established church and realized that you can't treat people wrong and call it right by quoting Jesus. That's coercion and it's manipulation and it's violation of conscience and it's sin. So let me tell you quickly his little story. Williams came to America in 1631, one year after the Puritans, to escape religious persecution. He was a priest 
in the Anglican church. And he came here to be free. And he took his freedom to his pulpit where he preached every Sunday in a little village called Salem, Massachusetts. But before long, the most controversial figure in the British colonies would be Roger Williams. Why? Because he believed that the state had no right to enforce religion on people. He believed in this odd idea that there should be religious toleration and no one should die, be killed, or persecuted because of their faith. Coming to America was like breathing fresh air, but when he arrived preaching liberty and freedom, he thought that people would latch on to this message because they had come to this country for freedom, but that was not the case because they wanted everybody to be free like them. And Williams responded, quote, to coerce people into a particular faith is to enforce uniformity of religion, which is to deny the very principles of Christ and Christianity. Forcing someone to be converted is nothing less than the rape of a person's soul. God does not need the sword of steel to assist the sword of the Spirit in the affairs of conscience. Roger had to run for his life after he said that. Because his former friends wanted to kill him. Kill him. In the colony that was begun on the principle of religious freedom. Five years after arriving in America, he left with his wife and his newborn daughter. Her name was Freedom. Freedom, by the way. And he escaped into the wilderness. He was eventually befriended by the native tribes and in that region. And he purchased from them the land that would become the state of Rhode Island. Rhode Island came up recently in a study by the Barna Group. Do you know who the Barna Group is? They're a, they're a Christian think tank. And what they do is they look at American culture and they track spiritual indicators and the role of faith in America. And a recent Bar Barna study commissioned by the American Bible Society sought to determine the level of Bible-mindedness, what a great phrase, in this country's major cities. And the rubric was real simple. Participants who claimed to read the Bible weekly and who strongly asserted that the Bible was accurate in what it taught, they were Bible-minded. And those who did not meet that standard were deemed unbiblical per the the Varna study. Now, you, you, no surprise here. The major cities in the South engaged and esteemed the Christian scriptures with the greatest fervency per Varna. You want to take a guess on the most biblical city in, in uh, North America? You're close. It's in the top ten. Knoxville and Chattanooga, Tennessee are in a tie with Shreveport, Louisiana. On the other end of the analysis, the major cities of New England, none of them were in the top tier. None of them could score above 20%, meaning the overwhelming majority of these people demonstrate, quote, resistance to the Bible, again, per the Barna study. But far and away, the most unbiblical city in North America is Providence, Rhode Island. Only 9% of the people there read and adhere to the Bible. Now, this should come as no surprise given the history I've just shared with you. Rhode Island began as a haven for religious dissidents. Those who could not bear up underneath the Puritan persecution all ran to Roger Williams to hide. The first Jews the first Catholics, the first Baptist, and the first atheist in North America all went to Rhode Island because it was the only place in New England where they could practice their faith without persecution. And Roger Williams welcomed them all, even though he disagreed by his own words with most of them. He still believed in the principle that it was not his place or right to impose his belief on other people. He said, and see if this sounds familiar, 
People have the unalienable right to choose and express their faith according to their own conscience. Herschel Hobbes, God rest his good Baptist soul, summarized Roger Williams' belief like this. A person should have the right to become a Baptist. The right. A Lutheran. A Roman Catholic. A Muslim. A Jew. A Jehovah's Witness. Or an atheist. Each individual is competent before God without coercion or interference. Violation of conscience is the worst of tyrannies, and it is made worse by its claim to be in the name of God who created men to be free. Roger Williams never lost his Christian faith. And to the end of his life, he would have scored very high on Bible-mindedness. He went on to organize the first Baptist church on American soil there in Providence, Rhode Island. But eventually he left it to become only what he called a seeker after Christ. So his religious path was one where he was an Anglican priest in England, a Puritan reformer in Massachusetts, a separatist rebel in Rhode Island, the first American Baptist pastor, to a non-denominational, non-affiliated Christian stripped down to the basics of faith, freedom, and liberty of the soul. And you can see why I talk about him so much. John Winthrop asked Roger to leave Rhode Island to come out of the cold back home to Massachusetts. He begged him to put aside these silly beliefs of his and just come home to Salem and to Boston. And Roger said, I cannot, for I feel safer among the Christian savages than I do among savage Christians. If he were alive today, I think he would say to us what he always said, quote, men's consciences ought never to be violated. For a religion that must be upheld by violence is a religion that cannot possibly be true. So let us be that light on a hill. Not because we are Americans, but because we are Christians. Not because of our loyalty and love for our country, though we eagerly pledge our allegiance to that flag. But because of our loyalty and love for Christ, who has the first place let us pray together. Jesus, great light of the world, fill up our hearts that your light would shine out in the darkness through us. Not for our own glory or the glory of a particular nation, but for the glory of our Heavenly Father, that he would be praised in all things. We ask this in Jesus' name. This song that we will sing during communion is one that, gosh, I guess Lutherans have been singing it for years. Faith of Our Fathers, did you ever sing that? The good Lutherans and, and, and maybe a few of us Baptists sang it too. And uh, I went to this little Christian school when I was in elementary school, and it was a real hardcore fundamentalist school, and we sang this every day. And uh, I didn't find out till I was an adult that we would have never sang that song in that school had they known the background of it. Faith of Our Fathers is written by a Catholic. And he wrote it. Uh, you going to play over there? Okay. Uh, he, he was a Catholic and he wrote it for Irish Protestants against them because they were rounding up and killing all the Catholics. And here we are in this little Protestant fundamentalist church singing Faith of Our Fathers and we probably would not have, have done that. But, but listen to the words. It is, a, it is a beautiful song. Faith of our fathers living still, in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword. Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whenever we hear the glorious word. The martyrs chained in prison dark were still in heart and their consciences free. And blessed would be their children's fate if they, like them, should die for thee.
faith of our fathers we will love, both friend and foe in all our strife, as love knows how, by saving word and faithful life. Beautiful song. Come to the Lord's table and let us celebrate the greatest gift of freedom, the freedom found in Christ as he gave his body and his blood on the cross for us. Faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeon fire and soul. Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whenever we hear the glory.
send all people unto thee and all the truth comes from God we all shall then be truly free faith of our Father pray together. Father, for your goodness to us and the grace that you have poured out on us as a people and upon this land, we give you thanks. Make us mindful that every good and perfect thing comes from your hand. This place where we live, this place that we enjoy, the beauty around us, the freedoms that we have. And then at the same time, call us to yourself that we would experience true joy, true beauty, true freedom in the Christ who has given himself for the world. And as he taught us to pray, we pray boldly. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Are you all right? You'll know this song, so let's stand up. Now. Our offertory. <laughs> As oh, I... Whoa, 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 just a, just a, <coughs> hang on, you're right. Thank you. Uh, a friend of many of you, of us, who he was at Simple Faith for many years, uh, Bill Evett, is going into the hospital this week for quadruple bypass surgery. So please remember him. Thank you, Billy, for reminding us of that. So pray for he and Betsy and their daughters. Uh, thanks for letting me know. Billy shared with that, that with me earlier today, and it just slipped my mind. Bill Evett, Betsy, and the girls, please remember them. This land is your land. This land is my land From California To the New York Island From the Redwood Forest To the Gulf Stream water This land was made Let's to do that again. land me This land is your land This land is my land From California To the New York Island From the Redwood Forest Gulf Stream water. This land was made for you and me. As I went walking down the Ribbon Highway, I saw above me an endless skyway. I saw below me that golden valley. This land was made for you and me. This land, this land is your land. This land, this land is.